So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this triple demic webinar. Because um, all we hear is a lot of people having all kinds of, um, to use a technical term, cruds. And so very thankful that we have our local physicians and public health officials here to tell us what's going on and uh, how we can all best get through this and through the holiday season and protect ourselves and our families. So I would like to turn it over to Dr. Cook, the public health, our Nevada County public health doctor. Dr. Cook, welcome. And um, what's going on in Nevada County? Well, thank, <clears throat> thank you so much for having me. And I'm really happy to be here with local physicians who are actually on the front lines treating all of these illnesses that we have going on currently. And I'm going to share my slides in just a second to kind of do sort of an overview of what's happening. And then we can dive deeper into it with our experts that are on the line. So <clears throat> I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Slideshow. Okay, can you see my screen okay? Yes. Yes, we can. Yes, okay. we can, but it is not it is not in, in presentation mode. So okay, let me see. If, if you I go to slideshow, that. that should Let's see if I can move it down and go into presentation mode. I think it's there. I think it's the button is hidden. Um if you just click on slideshow, I think that that'll do it. How's that? That's present of you. Oh, sorry. All right. I'm like missing my um, <clears throat> presentation mode. So let me go ahead and, well, I'm going to have to go on from here because I can't figure out how to, let's see. How's that? No. Nope. That didn't work either, huh? Let me try it again. Okay, let me try it again. I'm getting it up first. On the top menu, slide shows an option there. Okay. All right. Let me get it up first. Okay. Help me do. Slideshow. Okay, let me try it now. Is that showing? Perfect. Looks good. Okay. okay, great. Thank you so much. So again, I'm Dr. Sherilyn Cook. I'm the Nevada County Public Health Officer. And many of you have probably heard the term a triple demic, which is affecting not just Nevada County, but the state and the country as a whole. And so people ask, well, what is this triple demic? And um, <clears throat> let's see here. So the triple demic is comprised of primarily three viruses, COVID-19, influenza, and respiratory syncytial virus. They're all viral respiratory illnesses, and they are affecting different age groups. And we're going to talk a little bit about each of those. But I want people to be aware that those are not the only respiratory viruses that are circulating right now. We also have parainfluenza viruses. There's other coronaviruses other than COVID-19. There's enteroviruses or rhinoviruses, which are associated with common cold. And of course, we still have COVID and the other two that we're going to delve into a little bit deeper. So what's happening with COVID-19? We've been in the pandemic going on three years now. It's coming up upon three years. And we have noticed that 
many people did receive their vaccinations for COVID-19 and also the bivalent booster has become available just later on this year. We have noticed a drop off in people receiving their boosters, the bivalent. So not nearly everyone who's a, a eligible for the bivalent has received it. We are also seeing increased testing at our local testing sites. Our positivity rate of people who come in and get tested, that is increasing. And also our local physicians are gonna talk a lot a bit about hospitalizations. But one caveat, I just want people to keep in mind that reportable COVID-19 cases are only the PCR tests that are typically done at a healthcare clinic. They are not the home antigen test. Those are not captured in the data. So our infection rate is much higher than what is publicly reported. We're currently at about 12.2 per 100,000 people, but I would guesstimate anywhere between seven to 10 times greater numbers of COVID cases are out there because a lot of people don't test. Some people test at home and And it would appear that Dr. Cook is frozen. Are you back? Oh, can you hear me? Yes, you are back. Okay, good. <laughs> oh boy. Okay, so Nevada County had been in the low range for the Center for And we have we seem to have a problem with Dr. Cook's connection. So um, <clears throat> let's see if this works. Maybe, um, Jill, I know that you are around. Can you maybe talk us through this slide? Uh, sure. I can. Hi, uh, Jill Blake, Public Health Director for Nevada County. Um, oop, we just lost the slide. That might be contributing to me not being um, stable, but I'll just quickly go through the other data without the slide unless um, you can share those, Jill. Um, okay, so quickly, I'll just say that in general, influenza type A has also been on the increase and is causing many cases and hospitalizations in the community. So our flu activity has been up about 25%, 23.3% positivity for flu tests that are done. It seemed to have started in Southern California, but has spread North and is now affecting um, Northern California, it, you know, and it's a high, the whole state of California is now high for flu, influenza, which is predominantly type A, and also respiratory syncytial virus, which is most serious in young children under age two and in older adults, is increasing cases, hospitalizations. We have had one local death from respiratory syncytial virus in an elderly person with, you know, some underlying health conditions. But I am going to turn it back over to you, Pascal, to go into our local physician experts about what they're seeing in the community. Yes, thank you, Dr. Cook, and uh, welcome. And of course, we have our physicians here that, that can actually uh, talk urgently about what, what we are seeing right now. And I'd like to start it off with uh, Dr. Roger Hicks from Ubadox. Uh, as an urgent care physician, Roger, what, what is it that, what do you see, what, what is right now? What are the people coming, the patients coming through your, through your doors? What's going on there? Thanks, Pascal, and thanks for putting this on. Um, we are seeing people come in with cough and cold and fevers. Um, runny noses. I mean, it's just, it's the vast majority of people we're seeing right now are coming in with respiratory symptoms. Um, we, uh, we test on site for uh, COVID flu and RSV in certain cases. And we are seeing just a, a dramatic uh, rise in COVID and influenza. 
Um, the figures that Dr. Cook gave of, uh, I think, the 23.3%, those are the latest figures avail available. That's the case positivity rate uh, in California, but that's from, I believe, the week ending November 26th. And I think we've already seen uh, an, my, you know, anecdotal um, impression is we've already seen an increase since then. Um, yeah, so that's what that's what we're seeing, and I could, uh, I, you know, talk more about that, but um, I'm sure we'll get into other points. And uh, also, I'd like to welcome Dr. Lydia Stevens from Chapa Day. And Dr. Stevens, what? Uh, how are things at Chapa Day besides the incredible construction? Oh yeah, thank you. Yeah, I know we finished. We finished that. Um, so yeah, we've been equally as busy as Dr. Hicks was mentioning, seeing a lot of um, different viruses and trying to make sure we get um, taking people taken care of. Um, I think the thing that's surprising to me this year is there's less people saying yes to the flu shot. Um, and so um, that's been really hard because influenza A we're seeing is just very severe this year. Um, and so definitely recommending people get their flu shot. And then if they test positive for the flu within the first 48 hours, there's treatment um, called Tamiflu. So um, getting tested early, um, you know, with your doctor or at the county um, clinics is really important um, for treatment there. Um, but yes, we're seeing a lot of influenza. We're seeing a lot of RSV in kids um, and, and adults um, as well this year, and then and then COVID as well. Um, and so really just trying to um, support people and families um, as we move into the holidays and trying to educate people on how to stay safe um, so that um, we can spend time with our loved ones, um, but also decrease risk there. Thank you. And <clears throat> I believe that Dr. Cook also mentioned hospitalizations, which brings us to our two next uh, panelists, uh, Tyler Hill, Hill and Glenn Gookin. So thank you for joining us. And how are things at Sierra Nevada Memorial? And is there an uptick in hospitalizations? Hey, so thank you for having us uh, today, Pascal, and for, for putting this on. We're very appreciative. Um, so I'm the chief medical officer here at Sierra Nevada Memorial Hospital and uh, an emergency physician by trade. And we're definitely being significantly impacted by the triple-demic. Um, our our um, hospitalizations have dramatically increased for isolation cases, meaning all of the above. Um, specifically COVID and influenza. COVID numbers are on the rise, but influenza A, flu A has, has uh, definitely um, uh, increased over the last uh, few weeks. And we're completely full in house constantly with admitted patients. We're frequently boarding admitted patients in the emergency department. So what that means is that patients who need to be admitted to the hospital are sitting in an emergency department bed um, because there's no room for them upstairs yet. And then that impacts patients that are coming in new to be seen in the emergency department. So um, some prolonged waiting times and so forth uh, for some of those new patients. Uh, you know, with staffing challenges uh, related to illness is, um, is also taking effect and um, uh, challenging us as a hospital system. So it's kind of hitting both sides, our patient population and, you know, staff as well. Um, our ED volumes have consistently over the last two weeks been very, very high, much higher than our than our averages. So again, with these um, with these challenges of holding admitted patients longer than normal, that uh, that does seem to be a challenge. So you know, one thing that we are wanting the community to know is that um, if you feel you need to be tested for one of these illnesses that you're concerned about. Um, or you simply, you know, want to get checked out, we definitely encourage you to, um, you know, if you have a primary care doctor, reach out to them or one of the, uh, the other available clinics. Um, however, if you feel that you have an emergency, an emergent condition, or you feel you need to come to the emergency department, we are, we are definitely here for you and we still want to take care of you and see you, um, but, but also know uh, what the current state is and the, the, the current capacity challenge we're experiencing here at the hospital. Um, so yeah, Dr. Gukin, anything else to add to that? 
No, thank you very much, Dr. Hill and Dr. Stevens. Um, and, and I would just add that in line with, as Dr. Stevens was mentioning for um, treatment for uh, Tamiflu or treatment for the flu, that also in calling your primary care uh, or your urgent care facilities to ask for um, access to COVID treatment as well, if you do test positive within the first um, five days of your COVID therapy and you have high risk um, conditions such as heart disease, severe lung disease, um, uh, and other uh, things like obesity, we can help treat and administer those treatment platforms. We have lots of areas within the um, region, our pharmacies, our clinics that are administering Paxlovid, one of the therapeutics we have for COVID as well. So calling early and um, reaching out to your, uh, your urgent care or your primary care office when possible to try to keep the load off of our e um, emergency department, particularly if you're just interested in getting tested. And uh, this, yeah. this might... Pascal, I would yeah. I, I want to say that um, you know I emphasize what uh, what Dr. Hill and uh, and Dr. Gukin and Stevens have said, which is that um, there is treatment available for both influenza and COVID. These are antiviral treatments, and the, so they're different from antibiotics. And that you know the antibiotics kill bacteria in your system. These uh, respiratory, these antiviral medicines stop the viruses from multiplying. So that's why it's really important um, if you're having symptoms to come in to your doctor or our urgent care, um, hopefully not the emergency room, and get tested uh, early because the antivirals work best if they are started early before the uh, viruses have multiplied in your body. With uh, Tamiflu, which is the one for influenza, it works best if you start it within the first 48 hours and Paxlovid within the first five days. And we've seen so many people that have come in and said, oh yeah, I've been sick for a week. And it's like, uh, we could have helped you if you'd come in earlier. We could have helped you more. I mean, we will still help you, of course, but the treatment's more effective if you get tested and treated early. And 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 again, just to recap, the, the symptoms for all these illnesses are very similar. So it is probably for a lot of people, especially those who say, well, I've been sick for a week because well, is the cold? Oh, maybe I just got the flu. And so by the time people, is there anything, is there any uh, distinctive symptom where people should come in faster where it's like, hey, you know what, if you have a, a, fever, a, a fever up to a certain uh, amount of fever, come in immediately? Or is, it, or is it really just if you have any type of symptom, come in, go see your primary care or uh, or test or start? And when does it make sense to start, well, the, the home test for however well they work or uh, not work? When is that When is that a good thing? Yeah, excellent question. So um, I think that if you are a high risk person, so like you're, you know, a kid who's under the age of five, I would say, especially under two, but under the age of five, or you're above the age of 65, or you have some medical conditions that kind of make you high risk, um, I would say test early because um, the main benefit of these treatments is to prevent you from getting hospitalized um, and decreasing the length of symptoms that you have. So um, for those patients, I would say definitely try to get in as soon as possible. Um, the COVID home tests, I know, um, are, you know, on the box, it says you're supposed to test um, once and then wait 48 hours and test again. Um, so, you know, they're not perfect, but um, as the virus kind of replicates more and more, um, the higher the viral load is, the more easier the test is going to pick it up. So sometimes it can miss it in the beginning. Um, and so making sure that you're testing again or you're, you're getting a, a PCR test within the first five days of symptoms uh, with your provider or um, the county um, IHL clinic also has the test to treat there as well. So you can go and they can do a rapid test for you and, and treat you if you're positive for both the flu and for COVID. Dr. Um, Stevens, are there are there antiviral treatments for RSV? It's a very good question, Dr. Guggen. Um, so unfortunately, there's not um, antiviral treatments for RSV. I know there's um, been some um, science behind a vaccine maybe next year, so we're hopeful for that. 
Um, but the main treatment is really supporting um, the breathing and the care there. Um, I do want to actually maybe pass it on to Dr. Hill um, and Dr. Gukin to talk a little bit about what our hospital locally is doing and uh, in supporting families who have RSV um, in that way. Yeah, do you want to you want to talk to that a little bit, Dr. Gugan? Yeah, absolutely. We um, our our community hospital is well versed in taking care of kids with RSV, supporting them initially in the emergency department, and making the decision and helping you decide if we need to get your kiddo down to a tertiary hospital, a pediatric hospital. For the most part, we've been very lucky, knock on wood, that the severity of illness in our kids with RSV thus far this season has not resulted in a lot of um, hospitalizations. So main thing that you're looking for in, in kiddos with RSV is that those less than two are the ones we're most worried about, but also under the age of five. So you're watching for if they're really working hard to breathe, trying to, like Dr. Stevens said, clear their secretions using the suctioning devices on the market. I, as a father, swore I would never use a uh, the, the nose Frida, not to plug a brand, but suctioning my kid's nose many times throughout the night has been helpful and kept them out of the hospital in the past. So using those suction devices um, to help clear out their airways so they're not working so hard to breathe. And if they're working so hard to breathe that they're not eating or drinking normally, um, or not having a normal amount of diapers, that's times when you should bring them to the emergency room to have the doctors check them out. Um, and we can take care of them here and do proper triage. And occasionally they stay up here at Sierra Nevada, um, and occasionally we'll send them down the hill if they need it. So please bring them in. And the other thing with RSV and flu in our kiddos that I always encourage parents to do is to know your child's weight and to have a dosing, um, a dosing card on your refrigerator. You can find them easily online for Tylenol and ibuprofen. And when your ha kid has a fever greater than 100.3, particularly with RSV, the, the rapid rise in fever in the fever curve is what can cause kids to get real sick sometimes too. So dosing them appropriately with fever medicines, Tylenol and ibuprofen to keep their fever down so that they don't feel so lousy, so that they'll eat. And in the worst case scenario, prevent some of the rare complications that happen if the temperature gets too high. Very well said, Dr. Gugan, thank you. Okay, and uh, we had uh, a few questions uh, that came in over, over email and um, they mostly had to do with um, uh, COVID vaccine. So people who are asking that they have got all their COVID uh, boosters, got the bivalent shot, and is there anything, has the CDC uh, recommended any, um, what is the, the delay between uh, boosters now and uh, for people who got the bivalent bo um, vaccine, uh, are they to expect every six months, once a year? Is there any guidance that is out there at this point? There was just a, a study came out from the CDC on Friday um, that shows real life data with the bivalent vaccine, um, showing that it's, it's pretty effective, probably comparable to our flu vaccine, um, but it gets more effective the longer you know, it's spaced out between the prior one, um, especially for the older age groups. And so, um, I mean, this is a guess that I'm thinking we're probably going to need a flu shot and a covalent uh, or a bivalent booster every year. Um, but if you haven't gotten yours yet, um, it's kind of interesting. I think a lot of people don't realize that it's out there. Um, but um, if you haven't gotten it yet and it's been two months since your last um, dose, um, please come in because this this uh, vaccine doesn't only have the original strain of uh, of COVID, but it also has the Omicron strain. And so it is very different and it, um, it can help protect you for the season. And I think that's an excellent point, <clears throat> Dr. Stevens, because currently, the Omicron strains are the strains that are circulating. Every strain of COVID right now, which is circulating are Omicron. So the bivalent is much more effective for that than the initial vaccine. So it is really important. And you know, everyone who's gotten the full series of the initial vaccine has not gotten their bivalent booster yet. So we'd like to encourage you to do that as soon as you can. And flu shot, I've heard so many people say, well, I completed my COVID shots, but I'm not going to get the flu shot this year. You know, flu is causing, I believe, probably just about as much of a problem currently as COVID is, if you listen to what our providers are saying. So the flu shot is extremely important this year. And it's... Um... 
it is extremely important this year, especially since probably most of us, we, we all stayed home a lot and came in contact with less people. So maybe the natural immune system is not quite as prepared. And, uh, uh, and of course, you can get both your um, COVID, uh, any of the, the boosters or the, the bivalent and um, the, flu, uh, the flu shot at the same time, uh, same arm, different arms, it's, it's all possible. And uh, any the, the percentage that right now, I think statewide, the percentage is pretty low. And then this morning we um, we got a, a notice on the on, on a, a journalist forum that there is now there's Omicron and then there is the the new XBB that is also um, starting to creep in, in especially in, in in California and so that's one more reason and of course the uh, for pe for people who who are not ready for whatever reason to to get any vaccines there is of course. Uh, there are other ways also to protect yourself and, and protect others. And one of the interesting things was this morning, there's some rumors that Sacramento School District, if they if their uh, infection rates go up as well, they will bring back the masks. So can we talk can we talk a little bit about masking and why it's it's good for you, it's good for everyone else, and probably also good for the planet? Yes. Certainly. I mean, getting vaccinated is really important and and getting tested if you're sick, getting vaccinated and boosted and then getting tested and treated when appropriate. But uh, there's other things you can do. And one is stay home if you're sick, um, wear a mask uh, when you're in public places. And there's different kinds of masks. Um, the, you know, the cloth mask, those are the least effective. A surgical mask, which has some, you know, uh, fibers in it, some, you know, that are designed to um, to prevent the the wearer from spreading it to other people. So a surgical mask protects other people, and then the N95 masks that protects the person who's wearing it. So I, you know, given what I do all day, seeing people with COVID and flu and other respiratory illnesses, I wear a mask when I'm out in public um, because uh, I can't afford to get sick. We have some, we have had so many staff as, as had Dr. Stevens and Dr. Hill and Gukin and everybody uh, out with, with illnesses um, that I, I wear a mask in public and I encourage everybody else to do that too. There's a couple other things that you can do. One is, uh, of course, cover your cough or sneeze if you're in public, and then also wash your hands frequently. All of those things, um, you know, stay home if you don't feel well, get tested and treated, get vaccinated and boosted, wash your hands, cover your sneeze or cough, and wear a mask. All of those will reduce uh, your chance of uh, getting sick. And just to add to that, as we're heading into the holidays and maybe kind of um, meeting some of our loved ones that may be more vulnerable or high risk, um, kind of using those strategies that Dr. Um, uh, Hicks has just talked about, maybe wearing a mask around um, our elderly family members or our kiddos, um, and just kind of keeping an eye on those things so that um, we keep people healthy during this holiday season. Yeah, I agree with everything that's been said. And also just want to point out that all five of these tips, you know, vaccination, stay at home, wear a mask, wash your hands, cover your cough or sneeze. They work for all three respiratory viruses. We are most familiar with masking because of COVID, but we did notice that flu rates were down last year, we believe, which is partly in due to more people masking. There currently is no mask mandate in Nevada County or in the state of California. However, as health officer, I have always had and did not get rid of a strong recommendation to wear a mask when you're out in public, particularly if you have underlying health conditions or older and in crowded indoor settings. So that recommendation is still there. It is not a mandate, but I think this would be a great time to start using that mask and start pulling out the high quality masks like the KN95s or you know KF94s something that's higher grade even than a surgical, but certainly a surgical if you don't have anything else, because it will help protect you and others right now. 
And in throughout the county, I can say we have had several outbreaks of COVID and flu in some of our assisted living and nursing homes, you know, the most vulnerable, you know, people in our, you know, in our population. And these are people's grandmothers, grandfathers, loved ones. So we want to protect them as well, not just ourselves. So I did want to respond to, there was a, a question in the chat about, um, you know, secondary effects or infections from some of these viruses. And I wanted to speak to that on what we're seeing uh, admitted patients, you know, the effect that that's having on them. Um, so, you know, commonly we'll see elderly patients with influenza have altered mental status. They'll be confused. And then absolutely we will see, um, you know, an associated pneumonia, um, you know, whether there's a sec secondary bacterial component to that um, is always a, you know, a strong question, but we see um, effects to their kidneys as a result of them um, not, not being able to eat or drink, um, get up and go to the bathroom um, and dehydration uh, also. So we do see a lot of secondary effects and potential infections as a result of, um, of these illnesses. So all the more important, um, to, to really, um, you know, take note of what Dr. Hicks and, and the rest of the panel were suggesting, um, because many of these things we can, um, not always hundred percent prevent, but we can minimize the complications and the severity associated with them. So I definitely urge and, and plead with the community to, um, to really take note of these, uh, recommendations. Pascal, there was a question in the chat too about the um, the IHL site at the yeah. Ultimate Time, um, and um, the hours there are now um, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. They do test for uh, for COVID and flu, and they are prescribing Paxlovid on site there. Um, for those with uh, risk factors. And I just want to say, this was mentioned before, but the risk factor, the list of things that put you at risk for serious COVID is, or, and makes you eligible for Paxlovid is quite long. Like if you're over 65, if you're over 50 and not vaccinated, if you're overweight, like a BMI of over 25, a wide variety of medical problems, um, mental health issues, including depression, Pregnancy or recent pregnancy, uh, if you're a smoker, either a current smoker or former smoker, any sort of substance abuse like alcohol or other uh, recreational drugs, and if you're immunocompromised, whether from a disease or a medication, all of those make you eligible, uh, well, make you at risk for serious COVID and eligible for the Paxlovid. And uh, I believe uh, Jill just posted the, the uh, testing site. I was at 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. Uh, at the, the <clears throat> at the, the testing site where, uh, and again, the Vatican is pretty lucky that it is a test and treat site because that was something that, that has come up uh, a, a few times. And another question that, that, is, that we got via email is um, if, if people are... Uh, decide to to get the uh, a bivalent booster or flu shot now um is that will uh, will they be protected if they are traveling for the holidays and get together and while we're at it what are what is in your opinion uh as physicians what about gatherings um small large um what should we be looking for and what are some of the things that we maybe should and shouldn't do? I think that, um, you know, gatherings are, you know, at this point, people want to gather. We've been in the pandemic for over a couple of years now. So I think the shift has been to how can you do it the safest? And that entails if you're sick, stay home, don't come, you have to cancel at the last minute, you just have to do it, wear your mask. And there have been some gatherings, for instance, I had a 90th um, birthday party for my mom and we did antigen tests for everybody attending, you know, a smallish, smaller than we would have liked, but we did have antigen tests for people attending and we did find one relative who tested positive, who could not come in. So, 
you know, I mean, it, again, it's like a risk benefit, but I think that COVID particularly is here. We're having to learn how to deal with it. So we're trying to minimize the risk as much as possible. So there's, I don't think there's any one answer for everyone, but I'd like to hear what some of the other panelists have to say. Yeah, I definitely agree with, with a lot of those comments, Dr. Cook, um, um, regarding gathering. I did want to note, you know, from a hospital side, when we're talking about gathering, specifically um, um, visitation in the hospital, we have recently moved um, to a, a, a more strict uh, visitation policy to one uh, visitor per day, so a, a designated person um, for each admitted patient. So to minimize some of that risk um, coming in and out for those isolation cases, uh, COVID, influenza uh, are not allowed to have visitors. And then as far as the one visitor rule for everyone else, um, there are a, a few exceptions, pediatric cases, end of life, um, other um, you know, individual circumstances, um, but we are trying to minimize some of the, uh, the exposure and gathering so forth from the hospital side. And then in terms of um, how how soon are you protected after vaccination, it's usually like two weeks and for some people it's earlier and some people it's later. So we say really make sure that you know that, you know, the protection doesn't start right away. It does take a couple of weeks. Um, and so, um, you know, it's kind of like a layered approach. Vaccination is, is helpful, but masking and washing your hands and um, kind of staying home when you're sick, all of those things um, will kind of help with the protection there um, as well. And so, I, yeah, I agree with everything that was said in terms of just doing a risk calculation for when we're gathering. Um, everyone's calculation is a little different based on medical conditions um, and who's attending. And so I'm um, just kind of taking those things into account. And of course, if possible, the, uh, if, if the weather cooperates, outdoors is still better than indoors, I would assume. And uh, we all, and, and at some point, we all need to, to, to walk off the, the, the various feasts that we will all uh, either uh, cook and eat or just eat. So might as well. But I, I wouldn't recommend it this, this weekend, though, because there is a winter storm coming. So if you have plans and if you plan on... Um, going and getting tested or vaccinated so please also uh, look at the weather because <clears throat> it will be quite uh, quite stormy um we have uh i'm looking we have the i believe the secondary uh infections like pneumonia and is anybody willing to discuss the pneumonia vax recommendations Well, the, the pneumonia vax, the pneumovax has been around for years and it was recommended for individuals 65 and over and then with chronic conditions. And again, it's a bacterial pneumonia, which is different than the viral pneumonia. So getting that vaccine is protecting you against a bacterial infection versus the flu shot, which is protecting against a viral infection. Um, because I'm not in clinical practice right now, I don't know how many cases of pneumococcal pneumonia you're seeing, but um, that's what it's protecting against. And that's one of those diseases that literally can kill younger, healthier people. So certainly older people are much more susceptible. I don't know if any other docs have anything to say about the pneumovax or the Prevnar, the Prevnar, the other variations of pneumonia shots. Yeah, they did change it this year too. So it's age and then also underlying lung issues if patients have that to get that um, as well with your primary doctor. So definitely recommend it. And yeah, Walter, yeah, go ahead. Well, a lot of people have asked, why is it, you know, why are we having this triple demic? <clears throat> why are things so severe this year? And I think Part of the reason is that the last two years, people have been wearing masks and staying home and, you know, there's been shut down. So there's been there's been a lot less um, influenza and RSV in the past couple of years. So <clears throat> there's a RSV is mostly in affects young kids. So there's a whole batch of kids that never got it. And they're now, you know, now that uh, everybody has decided, well, not everybody, now that a lot of people are not wearing masks anymore, uh, there's more exposure. 
So uh, there's like three years worth of uh, kids uh, to get RSV. And similar thing with influenza, although the virus changes every year, uh, there was very, very little influenza last year and in, in 2021, 20, 22 season for the last two seasons. Um, so now we have all these, uh, you know, uh, vulnerable people. And I think because there wasn't so much flu and because of all the misinformation about vaccines, um, the uptake of flu vaccines is lower this year than it has been in the past. Perhaps you have some numbers on that. I don't know, Dr. Cook, if, if you do, uh, but that's been my impression that the flu vaccine uptake is lower this year. I don't have specific numbers for our area, but I think it's about 40% of eligible people are getting the flu vaccine, I think statewide. So definitely down, definitely much lower than what we would like it to be. And uh, you were talking about um, uh, kids getting sick. I have a, a question from a, a parent. Uh, on top of this triple um, are we seeing any um, uh, cases of whooping cough is that right now is is whooping cough and and uh, if so what basically the basically it's a parent who's, who's really concerned about all these respiratory illnesses that are around right now and uh, so best practices to uh, keep uh, kids healthy Well, there, I have not seen any pertussis. I don't know about you, Dr. Stevens or Dr. Gugan, but I haven't seen any so far this year. Um, the, there is a vaccine for that that's in standard, uh, you know, the routine childhood vaccines, and it's in uh, available along when you get a tetanus booster. It's, it can be part of that. Uh, so whooping cough is definitely a preventable bacterial disease. One other thing though, is that um, the flu season is like two months earlier this year than in other years. It's, you know, it's numbers are really high now and that usually doesn't happen until January. Yeah, the, the, the early reports, this is the worst flu season this early in a decade is what um, a lot of the reports are saying. And you're right, Dr. Hicks, normally we see the peak somewhere in late January, early February. So. We're, we're well ahead of the curve. So that's even more of a concern that we're this high this early. And the other thing that we've seen through the pandemic is that some of our well child checks and things have been deferred. And so people, not everyone's vaccinated fully um, as children. And so just making sure that you guys, um, that parents are bringing their kids in to kind of get up to date on their vaccines for preventable things like whooping cough and, um, and flu can definitely save lives there. And uh, with, <clears throat> excuse me, not another question coming in. Um, how how come that all of it, all of a sudden everybody's talking about RSV? Um, can you can you talk a, just a little bit about why RSV? Uh, well, uh, okay, so it's. Uh, RSV is really, uh, there's a lot of it in the media, but nobody's really talking about what it is and what it isn't. So can you give a definition of what RSV is and also who can get it? Sure, I, I, I can jump in there. Respiratory syncytial virus has been around for a long time. The main thing that changed recently during the pandemic and with it is one of the um, introductions of our current PCR testing platform uh, that tests for respiratory syncytial virus. Previously, viral cultures are very hard. You swab a nose and you do it on a Petri dish and grow it in an incubator, and it can be very hard to grow and, and see that viral virus show up. So a lot of it's been that we weren't testing for RSV in the past. Um, and so I noticed this introduction when I worked as a hospitalist a few years back that we started seeing it and everyone asked that exact question. And it's mostly that we used to dismiss RSV like many of the other common causes of the cold, like Dr. Cook referenced on her initial um, initial presentation. Things like um, uh, uh, 
other types of parainfluenza, rhinovirus, other common causes of the cold. So a lot of us will get RSV and we'll have very similar symptoms to just the common cold. But now that we have a testing platform that easily tests for it along with COVID influenza um, and both types of influenza, we, we are just seeing much higher rates of it. So it's in the media more because it's just being reported. So just like Dr. Cook said, when you do a home test for COVID, we don't know that's not being reported in the data, only the PCR tests are. And a lot of that's just been the progress of medical um, uh, of medical technologies. Ten years ago, it used to take almost 12 hours to run a PCR test for the most part. Rapid PCR technology has improved markedly over the past decade, which has really increased our um, our turnaround time and us learning about it. And then I'm just going to have add one of the you know pediatrics or family practitioners speak on RSV because. It is one of those viruses that can start and become very severe very quickly in the very young. So maybe you can comment a little bit about that. Um, yeah, I think so. 90% um, of kids by the age of two have had RSV. And so in the past three years, we've deferred that a lot. And so now it's like playing catch up for those children as well. Um, in addition, um, you know, we are seeing a little bit more of a severe season this year with RSV compared to prior years. We still had people die from RSV and flu pre-pandemic as well. And um, not a lot of attention was kind of necessarily put to that, but our hospitals were, were very full back then as well, more in January and February. Um, so this virus has been around a long time, like, um, like Dr. Gukin was mentioning, um, but also a community immunity to it has been a little bit low in the last three years. Um, and our immune systems have seen other viruses like perhaps COVID that creates more inflammation and makes it more likely to have more severe things with RSV on top of that or flu on top of that. So um, getting all of those things you know, um, together can, can also cause more damage. And Dr. Stevens, you mentioned a future RSV vaccine. Why don't, there is a, a vaccine for uh, RSV. Why don't all kids get that? Yes, that's a good, good point. So there is a antibody that we can give people, kids who are really high risk. And so those are kids who are born prematurely, who have underdeveloped lungs. Um, and so they should be getting that vaccine um, every month. Um, but it is only reserved to those high risk children. Um, currently, we um, based on cost and supply and um, how effective it's been in those kinds of studies. Um, so I'm hoping the next year we'll have one for more more people. But if if you do have a child that is premature, uh, making sure to coordinate with your primary to get that is really important. Okay, so um, we are well, we are appro approaching the end of the hour. So first, thank you for for being here and for for sharing all this. And maybe um, I believe that um, one of the the most important things so as to well take taking care of yourself, taking care of others. So with the mask, and again with the upgrading your mask, if I'm not mistaken, that is a that seems to be a um, a good a good advice because and I believe that there's even and if if this works uh there we go uh I believe that was the slide that uh Dr. Cook that you wanted to uh, uh, share with us as well and so the surgical the the only thing is so the cloth mask that fits well has three layers is still not as good as a surgical mask is that correct? Yes, that that is correct. You know, surgical masks have, you know, sort of like a waterproof layer. They have different layer. They're layered as well, just, you know, very fine material. So you don't necessarily see it as a layered mask. But yes, a cloth mask is better than nothing. It's, it's helped some. A surgical mask is better than that. If you go to a KN95 or KF94, it's um it's it's much better and it's sort of like wearing a cloth mask and a surgical mask and of course the N95 is the best but I do want to add a caveat on the N95 you can't walk around your normal day and spend eight or ten hours in an N95 if it's worn properly you just simply cannot breathe in it so they're not comfortable and they're not designed to be worn all day they were designed to be 
worn into an isolation room in a hospital for a patient who's sick to protect the healthcare providers. So, I mean, they're very difficult to wear and that's why you see a lot of people wearing them and they're hanging below the nose. And if they're doing that, they're really not doing you any good. So I think it's much better to go with, you know, a KN95 or something that you can at least more comfortably wear throughout the day. So that's important. And, you know, again, we've got three different viruses that are kind of going, you know, at high rates right now. But I did just want to point out there are a couple of resources. One that's already been mentioned is the county has testing sites available where you can get tested for COVID and flu and you can get COVID tested, treated on site. We're encouraging people to start with their primary doctor. They're having symptoms, call your primary doctor and go that route because they can guide you to the best way to get care. Is it in the office? Is it at urgent care? Is it going to emergency department? They can do an assessment. I also wanted to point out if someone has no insurance and they're concerned about that, there is a telephone video option for patients that are uninsured called Sesame Care, which is sponsored by the state. They set up video visits and they it's free and they can also treat COVID for free. It's not for everything. It's specifically for COVID, but I just want people to be aware that that is a resource available. And it's Sesame, just like a Sesame Seed. It's called Sesame Care, and you can get free, uh, you know, virtual visit and treatment for COVID. So I want people to be aware of that if you are uninsured. But if you're insured, please call your primary doctor because they know you best and they can definitely direct you to the appropriate resources. And if you don't have a primary care doctor, we are available in the county uh, site at summer times. I just confirmed with Kim Stein, who is our emergency preparedness and response coordinator. The hours there are Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, nine to five. And they do test for influenza as well as COVID and they're prescribing Paxlovid on site. Perfect. And, uh... Dr. Hill, Dr. Gerking, and Dr. Stevens, any parting words of wisdom? Yeah, I would just end with, you know, we really wanted to do this uh, for the community to, um, you know, inform um, our, our county about the current state of the triple demic. And um, we, we care about y'all and we want to inform you about the best routes to take care of you, yourself and loved ones. So please take this seriously. Um, and we, again, we urge you to, um, to take note of the recommendations that have been made. So we appreciate your time and um, very appreciative to have this opportunity to, to talk with our county. I would uh, second that and just say um, thank you to everyone and, and just ask everyone to keep treating each other with respect and kindness when you see people wearing masks in public spaces to honor their wishes and hopefully even model yourself after them. And that uh, our hospital is a, a safe place. I took my daughter to Sierra Nevada with a bad bout of RSV last year and was very well cared for by our emergency room team there and felt very comfortable with it. So I take my family there. It's a safe place and it's a, a jewel for our community to have that here. And I would end with, uh, or I'd also add to that saying that there's just excellent providers here and we're all here to kind of take care of you during this um, season. Um, we are seeing a lot more people who are sick. So just be kind to your, your medical provider when you see them um, and um, get vaccinated, wear a mask and um, you know really take care of yourselves during this holiday season. Right. With that, uh, thank you, everybody. Thank, uh, thank you for thanks for your time. Thanks for the, to those who joined us live. And uh, with that, happy holidays, everybody. Stay safe and yes, be kind. Bye. Thanks, Pascal. Thank you.